Manassas Foundation. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, LA, and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello? Hello, could I please speak with Christy? Hello? Could I please speak with Christy Edmonds? Yeah, this is Christy. Christy, this is Paul, Paul Holden Graber calling you. I'm so pleased that you can be part of the quarantine tapes. How are you today? <laughs> I'm well, I'm well. How are you? I love that little laugh. <laughs> and another one. Yep, I've got a few of them. It's like, I'm not really at the end of my work day, but my work day has been going for eight weeks. <laughs> What what has your work day? What have your work days been in the past eight weeks? Oh well, I mean, obviously, it's that extraordinary amount of range between looking after people, finding out what's going on with artists, trying to help, um, figuring out the you know future of our forms, and you know, expanding oneself as far as you can. Yeah. How about you? Well, you know, my life has become tremendously regimented. Huh. Because I, 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 you know, the, the, the quarantine has created this, this series, the quarantine tapes, and I'm chronicling, I suppose, what some people are, are thinking about in this moment and how they are reacting and, sure. and what it might mean. And, um, you know, uh, I, I might even refer to, to to some of the people I've spoken to because, in a, in a sense, uh, at least in one of the conversations, we we spoke about you. Um, let me let me ask you first of all, if you could, for the for the pleasure of our listeners, if you could introduce a little bit the work you you did before the quarantine, the work you're doing during the quarantine and the work you hope to be doing after the quarantine, which is a way for me to say, can you introduce CAP at UCLA and, and what, what its work is and sure. the, hiat sure. the hiatus now, of course. Yeah, well, um, you know, I serve here as the artistic and executive director of a large performing arts presenting organization that's called the Center for the Art of Performance um, at UCLA. And really what that is is probably the contemporary art museum equivalent of live performance. And so I work with choreographers and dance companies, um, you know, music makers, composers, ensembles, theater practitioners, often cultural commentators, and our literary you know, extraordinary minds in literature. And we bring them, uh, we invite them, we participate in their art as it's being created and developed, and then we present it for our communities here in Los Angeles. And so uh, a lot of where people would recognize our work or experience it at a local level in Los Angeles would be Royce Hall and also at the theater at the Ace Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So my job as a curator um, to care for Right. Contemporary performing arts, as as made very closely in consultation with the artist. I've always liked the the real definition of curator, someone who <laughs> you know someone who takes care of. I was once asked to define what what I what I do, and I said I'm I'm the curator of public curiosity, which is an, mm. uh, yeah, another way of expressing this. But in 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 your case, so much. Um, there's such a need for for an audience, and here oh, we yeah. and here we are uh, <clears throat> with a, a sensory deprivation of an audience. And I'm I'm curious, um, Christy, if you can bring me back eight weeks and tell me what was the last performance you attended of your own at at Cap. Well, there were two, and I'll describe them both because they 
uh, I think, matter immensely. Mm. The last performance where we had a large and full, you know, diverse community of audience members was for um, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower that was created by Toshi Reagan and her mom, Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, uh, in a song cycle opera format of this extraordinary text. And it was literally, you know, when the, when the artists were flying in and they were coming in, I knew, by then we knew, we were already moving into getting hand sanitizer and everything cleaned and the custodial staff was doing that. It was not yet under the orders, it was just human logic and care. We were able to obviously proceed with that program. It was uh, immensely uh, powerful, uh, especially given the kinds of, it was quite prescient. Mm. Um, so that was the last performance that we had with a live audience, but at this exact same time, and it was literally, you know, only a few days after, uh, Parable of the Sower had, had played here that, you know, the beginnings of major events starting to need to be, you know, halted if there were gatherings of over 200 people and the performing arts programming that would close out the remainder of our season was, um, I like to say, suspended as opposed to canceled, um, which I can describe, but I think it's important. Um, but at the same time, we had two other, we had a theater company from Canada that was on their way here. They had landed in the U.S., and we also had Lady Smith Black Mombaso from South Africa that had landed. They were landing in Chicago to pick up their tour, and they would come to Los Angeles. So in the case of Porta Parole from, from Canada, they were notified that they would be put in quarantine and the sooner they came home, the better. Uh, so they turned around and went back. We were looking after them emotionally and then with all of our support. And Lady Smith, as they were in touring, you know, their incredible music ensemble, and as they were touring, each successive city was closing down. And they and I said, look, come here. We'll look after you. You can regroup and think about what you want to do. And so they came. They spent the weekend here just recovering from jet lag and the cascading realities that were all happening. And we decided to present the program under full production conditions without an audience. Mm -hmm. And we videotaped it and it was just extraordinary. It was uh, when we still had, you know, you could have 50 people together. They hadn't yet closed restaurants, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it was coming. It was intuitively, we knew this would be next. So we had everyone on stage. They performed the full work. We, uh, did a three camera shoot and then edited the material and streamed it out with um, KCRW about a week later. And it was while Lady Smith had returned then to South Africa and they were in, you know, quarantine. And this online experience was just profound uh, here as well as in South Africa. And uh, it was a sense of deep appreciation for the many, many, many audience members that couldn't come obviously and so they sang to those empty seats and we all imagined who would have been there and knowing that we would make a gift of the work to them after refunding their tickets as a kind of way of saying we are still here with you is this a performance archived can we hear it yeah, sure. I can send you oh, the link. Do. It's on our website. Please and it's do. Also send it to me because we'll <clears throat> also put it on the website of, of Dub Lab. So that yeah, it's so, really know. uplifting for people. The music, the message of their music, the culture of the resilience that they carry so generously and beautifully. And uh, yeah, just extraordinary. Christy, you know, you say uplifting. And if, if I may say this, um, I hear in... in the tone of your voice, um, for lack of a better word, um, kind of a sadness. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, sure. I haven't heard you this way before. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, yes, there's sadness, of course, my God, but there's also, um, uh, I don't know, some mm, level of exhaustion. I mean, right. I, I, I that. truly... I truly, it, it, you know, the, as I knew what was going to happen in the performing arts <clears throat> with these cancellations, I knew the impact it would have on artists. So literally like the third phone call that I made after we set into motion looking after people um, and talking to the artists that would be 
<clears throat> impacted on our own programs, I reached out to uh, Dina Hagag at the United States Artists saying there is going to be an incredibly impacted community of artists here immediately. We need to start some kind of a relief effort. And of course, she'd already been thinking about it. And so during the day, I would be doing the work I needed to do with my staff, working remotely and the change and audiences and refunds and communication and all of it, but also working on trying to raise money and create a a dynamic um, where we could have an artist relief fund. And they did an incredible job over three weeks in raising money and then offering these emergency grants which are still going. Um, so it was just that kind of thing. You, you, you don't have something certain and you don't have what's certain is that everything's changing, but one can't stand still. You have to find more resolve, to keep going so that you can help all the different people that you know in whatever way you can. <clears throat> uh, for this kind of very unsmooth landing. So early March was like the 24 seven right. that has tended to now be eight weeks long. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And, and, and I, I, I want to mention to you that the way you came up in a previous quarantine tape conversation was I had the pleasure of speaking with Linnell George and the very, very last performance she went to which she said she will never forget because of you know because of the performance but also because of when it happened and what it was was toshi reagan in the parable of the sower yeah it just uh, uh, and, and because you know linnell writes so brilliantly about los angeles and what an incongruous unlikely place it is she, yeah. um, you know we, which you and i have spoken about a little bit um it it it, it struck me as a, a question i really wanted to ask you because there you are a huge performing arts uh, um, uh, um, uh, program, one of the largest mm. in the country, and you're missing, like many people, the very thing that you need the most, which is the audience. And, and I imagine that you, you, you must miss the audience, but you must also, knowing you, you must so much miss the artists. And I imagine you're very much, as you said a minute ago, very much in touch with them. And I'm wondering, yeah. what are you hearing from them? Of course, you're hearing different things. But if you could give me a sense, what are artists telling you at this moment beyond, I, I need this and that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because it's not artists saying to me what they need. Right. And, and that is so typical of the generosity of spirit of why artists even make. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, it is a continuous life practice where you put your ideas in front of people to create useful meaning or the provocation to be awake differently, which is fundamentally an expression of a kind of love for a stranger, mm -hmm. a love for a community that you don't know by name but is present for that work. I love and this. I love this. Just, I love for a stranger. I love it. it. It just is. It's like, um, you know, working alone, working then with their company or ensemble, making a work, doing creative development, trying to find form so that the work lands into its future in a way that can be made useful to a community, a culture, a time in place. And so the conversations that I've been having with artists is truly those of, it's not an expression of need, although it's vividly clear. You, you know, the economics of live performing art hmm. are so profoundly impractical and yet vitally important. And there is an interdependence between the audience who, is, who are not consumers. We don't look at them as consumers we look at them as participants in community. Thankfully. It's like the ticket sales and the scales of those tickets or contributions are all a kind of gift-based economy 
that is there to fall forward towards saying, let's keep this work in motion. Mm. It's not, um, it's not about, uh, well, that's why it's the, not about, that's why the artists are talking to you. Yeah. And so really the discussions are, you know, first of all, how do we look after each other? Second of all, checking in, have you heard from so-and-so? Have you heard from so-and-so? Somebody's in Italy, somebody's in Spain, somebody's in Seville, who knows somebody there? You know, all these different kinds of things, of course, would be going on. But really, the biggest essence of it is, how do I make my work find a way from here with absolutely no economy to speak of, and yet they still want to give it exchange it and try to find a way to put it out there. So there's this real um, trying to figure out ideas of how one <clears throat> expresses the, the work itself and the value of it. But it's, you know, gosh, if we don't now have a stage with an audience, in what way do we pivot? In what way do we keep making? In what way do we share past work or put something out online or so there's this extraordinary flood of artists putting as much as they can out there. And at the same time, there's, you know, there, uh, everyone's in a kind of suspension. So some are making new ideas and some are thinking through that future. Some of them, especially in dance, you know, dancers have never lived a lucrative life. <laughs> And so they live in tiny apartments and yet they need space to move their bodies to right. keep that in shape. And they're trying to, you know, have rehearsals on Zoom calls and things like that. And there's a time delay. And But it's a still, it's this process of staying together, creating continuity, dreaming the future forward, holding on together and seeking ways that they can be useful to the communities that they are a part of. And in what way can they create um, work at this moment? And uh, another question that comes to mind is, do you have a sense that new forms of art might emerge from this ter <clears throat> terrible pandemic? Uh, uh. Yes, I, I absolutely have no doubt that new forms of art will emerge from this pandemic. Uh, artists don't avoid looking mm -hmm. um, at the world very deeply even when under extraordinary trauma and strife but I think right now you know right now it's 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 literally more about I don't want to I, I don't want to make a, a work that carries the scale of an ambition that I held before but I want to find the form anew that allows its mobility again to come forward. So what I'm finding is that the, it's, it's, you know, even myself as an artist, back when I was making art, I would do a project at a certain, I would do a project when I needed less pressure. It was called small sublime things. And it could be anything from, you know, a doodle on a napkin to, uh, something on the back of a, you know, matchbook or whatever I could find and living in a shoebox. It was not, and it gave me a sense that I could create something as like a small gesture of, of something that was a time capsule that maybe would have a form later. Artists are doing a lot of those kinds of things now. Um, and you have this time now to to help artists, but also, I suspect, to reflect on 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 what um, CAP will look like, hopefully, when it reopens. And I'm wondering oh, if, if it's oh, yeah. shifted, if it's shifted <clears throat> the way you think about um, your priorities and what you want to achieve uh, when, when you reopen. I want to be there for the reopening. And, well, and, good, and, Paul. And, and clapping. And hopefully it. there will be many like you who want to... Uh, help us get there. Yeah, but tell me, it's, tell me, uh, what, do, you know, what do you imagine? The, the reality is, is, you know, after Toshi's performance here with Parable and after Lady Smith's return to South Africa, 
there were another 13 different projects that would be now postponed. There was also the full next year, next season's program from mm. September through May with all of the work in theater, dance, music, international, et cetera, et cetera, that was heading towards our you know, announcement and publication, which we usually do around now, end of April type of time period. So first is the fulfillment of a promise that something that is sitting in the realities of the, of the contract under force majeure does not mean that the promise of an intent can't be fulfilled or that it is just abandoned. So what we did at the center was begin immediately working with the artist to reschedule things into the 2021, 2020, 2021 season and find dates and times and do all of that and create continuity. And then to use the very limited resources that we had to put deposits against those contracts so we could move some small part of the resource out to help the artists who now had no income whatsoever. And as the elongation of COVID-19 continues and the future remains very uncertain, we have these conversations that are literally like with audiences, with different demographics of our audiences, with the artists themselves. And a lot is the constant learning and unlearning because we already know that many of the audiences, no matter how much they long for the work, which definitely has a shape and it's big, that they won't probably feel, no matter how voracious uh, they are as cultural omnivores, they'll be unlikely to return if they're in a certain age group or pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. until there's a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question becomes, and that's very different than when the governmental health orders, uh, you know, start to, the restrictions lift, which they're doing now right. with some cacophony of results. But <sighs> nonetheless, uh, there's still the psychology of human care and yeah. the security and, and sense of safety and sense of welcome and belonging and meaning all have to be looked after. So what we've obviously started to do is pivot things towards how we look after the audience who want to be here but can't for their own choice and their own circumstance in that future so that we can film things and stream them, of course, to create continuity in that place. And also, you know, students and schools, and there's a way for us to create mobility through this um, apparatus. And so we're doing some of that. Other artists are very interested, mainly internationally, because many different, we don't know what the autumn is going to to uh, hold for us all. And we have to look after those artists too and can't make it that if you come, you'll be paid for your performance. Um, and that need for resources can override discomfort and vulnerability. We won't do that. Plus, you know, with the State Department shutting down visa applications and all of that, the backlog is going to be absurd. So with many of the international artists that we had on the program, it's like we're recommissioning ideas together that can hold from a distance and those two will be stream, streamed. And then the following season, um, they will return live. So really it's this giant pivot of how we refine form so that we can keep putting our work into the world in ways that, that, that are meaningful and say to audiences and our supporters, we miss you. We still see you. Yeah, and this we, is our effort. No, this I, is our effort to relearn a new form through our music, theater, and dance, and writing and speaking that can hold uh, for you. Economically, it's very challenging, but it's still the way you keep culture in motion for the time being. You know, I, I, I hear this so much in, in, in the tone of your voice and in what you're saying, which is, we, we miss you. And I came across a quotation that I know, or I think I know, you love. 
And in the context of now, it might be interesting to unpack it. It's a quotation by Wim Wenders, where he says, the most political decision you make is where you direct people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And in the context of now, how are you directing people's eyes in this moment when you, in, in effect, can no longer bring them together in a theater, <clears throat> but you, you, you know, the, the, the longing and the urge is to bring them together in that theater in a safe way and not risking people's uh, health for uh, just because. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So I'm I'm curious, you know, uh, this Wim Wenders quotation, which I absolutely did not know, but I will add now uh, to my list of quotations since I am, as you know, a quotomaniac. I'm, I, <laughs> <laughs> it is very beautiful, and it's quite profound. It really is. And how does it speak yeah. to you in the in the last few moments we have? How does it speak to you now, Christy? I suppose, you know, uh, not to sound silver lining like, but there are things to direct people's eyes to by slowing the rate of our ambition. Mm. Mm. That I do think will help our wisdom as we move into a future where the natural world and the climate change and all of these things, I feel that there is some um, gift of listening for perspective in the fact that we do have the capacity to slow our frenetic, hyperproductive world into some other rhythm that is going to become important. And when I'm directing people's eyes in relation to art and the newsletters we send out every week and things like that is about this kind of reflection. I mean, artists, they always have made work for the future moment. And what happens is that when something cataclysmic or substantial or major in our personal lives or in our cultural lives or in our societal lives, or in the case of the U.S., our political life, that work we can hear differently. But it was made long before we needed it. So the thing that I feel is that this is a chance for people who care about art or performance or theater or dance or paintings or films or radio or books to recognize that the work was made that we lean towards now um, in advance of the moment we most needed it. And now we have a chance to think about how we help that recover so that it will be there in advance for other moments in time, generations, and our sense of continuity. For other generations like, that might not, you know, that an artist produces work now for a generation they will never know. Oh, yeah. And with performance, I mean, it's, it's our most evanescent and ephemeral form. And audiences become the living archive of what happened on that stage. Mm. And how they carry that, how they possess that in memory, reflection, longing, wisdom, provocation, whatever that is, it's still there. It's like that work gets completed because it's continued to be reflected on and use, useful. So while we get the chance to do that, which what we can't now immediately proceed with, we can know that when it comes back towards us in live space and whatever contour that is, <clears throat> it still has us very much in mind. Christy, what a pleasure it is to, to talk with you and how much I, I hope that the audience will come back um, soon and that this moment will, will too pass, even if we are terribly un mm. unsure as to, to when or how. Um, it's been it's been good to talk to you, and, and to you as well, Paul. Uh, and I send you a huge, for the moment, virtual hug. And right back to you. you Thank will. you, Paul. Bye bye. 
Bye. To support this show and DubLab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com slash support. Thank you.